Hello and welcome to our next talk. Um, just to let you know that we're very close and this talk kind of possibly will overrun over the Armistice Day two minute silence. So I'm going to try and keep to time precisely so that we can take that as a break before the next one, but it will mean that the next talk is just two minutes later on the scheduled time because it was scheduled at 11 o'clock. But this talk, uh, which I'm looking forward to, is from Robert Smith. He's a PhD student from the University of Sheffield, whose research focuses on the application of health economic decision modelling in public health. He's been involved with multiple projects, including the World Health Organisation and Park Run UK. We've got quite a few runners in analysis, which is really nice. His talk today is on decision modelling in our shiny. Over to you, Robert. Hi, thank you. Um, so the title of this uh, this presentation I kind of changed after seeing John Lucas um, play on 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 R. Um, so so I guess it's are you ready for for shiny health economics? Um, so I'm based at the University of Sheffield. Um, uh, just finishing up a PhD there, uh, having worked previously as a health economist, um, and we obviously do consulting work um, through a company, uh, my company, Dot Beaker Analytics. Um, so. Just by a bit of background, John Lucas covered this, um, so I can kind of skip through fairly quickly. Obviously, in a world with um, finite resources but infinite wants, we need to um, determine how to, to allocate those scarce resources. Um, and so then that means decisions have to be made. Um, so, for example, in a healthcare setting, that might mean um, being tasked with deciding between um, allocating resources towards uh, breast cancer reduction or uh, diabetes prevention um, and so it's those kind of decisions that, that health economists are, are tasked with trying to understand how to make that decision um, and John Lucas covered kind of the idea behind cost benefit analysis and the idea that that you would want to to understand both the costs and the benefits in terms of uh, health benefits and well-being benefits um, associated with that um, so in terms of the modeling framework um, so Typically, the, these models are um, quite time consuming to build. And so um, a lot of time will be spent understanding the decision problem. Um, so in this case, trying to understand what the, the costs and the benefits of an intervention are um, and building a conceptual model uh, of those, those costs and benefits um, before trying to implement it in some kind of um, uh, statistical software. Um, so. I guess this is kind of similar to, to John Lucas' slide where you had some um, stats work that's similar to the um, NHS stats work that might be conducted and that feeds into a, an economic model. Um, but I guess taking a bit of a broader perspective here, we also want to understand how decision makers will engage with that decision making process. Um, so typically um, the choice of software for your model uh, will vary depending on the complexity of that model. So take um, a very simple example might be a decision tree um, in which we know that drug A has some um, predicted uh, quality adjusted life years and drug B has some predicted quality adjusted life years and some cost. And those types of models might typically be built in, in Excel. Um, it's just quicker and simpler to build those models in Excel. Um, there are R packages available um, but Excel tends to be the way that this is done. But as complexity increases, um, we tend to, to find that more models are, are created using R, C++, Python. Um, so for example, uh, a cohort model, um, so a state transition model in which um, we want to keep track of the number of people in different health states over the, for example, the remainder of their life course, that kind of thing can be done in Excel and is typically done in Excel. Um, but there's a big push uh, being led by, by John Luca to move that type of work into R and R packages such as HeSIM uh, really help with that. And then as we kind of move to the right towards really complex individual level models, um, the type of thing is, is currently typically being done in R or other programming languages. Um, and there's a great uh, discrete event simulation uh, package, Simmer, which is, is typically used for that. Um, so, just taking a sort of broader perspective, um, and this is this is quite similar to, to John Lucas' slide uh, on um, the statistical analysis for the input, and a lot of people now are using R for that side of things. So, um, so for example, John Lucas um, 
uh, serve HE package um, could be used to fit survival uh, curves to trial data. Um, but currently, a lot of the time, uh, health economists are then taking the outputs from those models and fitting them uh, into an, an a economic model that's been constructed in Excel and run in Excel BBA. They then tend to take the results of that and create some plots in Excel, put those into a Word document, and present them to, to decision makers. Um, however, what tends to happen, and from my experience uh, working in, in R and, and Excel, is that at each stage of this, you will have um, some stakeholder or decision maker who doesn't necessarily agree with one of the assumptions that you've made in the, in the economic modeling, um, or has some new uh, data or some new meta-analysis that they want to, to include in, in the model. And so you tend to go back and have to re-run um, your um, R file and get a new set of output and then input it into Excel. And so this whole process is just hugely wasteful in the amount of time it takes to um, kind of update models and recreate models based on new information. Um, so what John Luca and other people at the Health Technology Assessment Group um, are for HDA, um, kind of trying to encourage is the use of R in the whole pathway. So this is one example. So um, packages like serve HE could be used to fit a survival model. Um, then HESIM could be used to um, model the, uh, or create the economic model. The plots could be done in ggplot, report written and markdown, and the whole thing um, wrapped into a shiny app, which then allows users to play around with some of the model inputs and see what the effect of those model inputs are on the results. Um, this means that if there's some assumption or some new data that, that arises, um, the whole thing can be updated uh, with one click of a button. Um, and there's, there's no need to be copying and pasting tables and plots over and over again every time um, one decision maker in a committee changes their mind on what assumption should be used. Um, so this is kind of the way we see the future um, of of health economics, and it's quite similar to what you've been talking about at NHS. Huh? Um, and there's a huge number of benefits. So, firstly, in sort of that one click update and the amount of time that wastes for health economists. Um, obviously, time time is money, and people are uh, companies and uh, nice are paying quite a lot of um, money for these submissions. So, any way to make them cheaper is obviously appreciated. Um, there's also other benefits of moving to script-based models. So um, they're faster to create. Um, so R and Python, incredibly fast um, to build a model in, especially if you already have a package like uh, HESIM. Um, but also the computational power when you're doing, trying to understand uncertainty. And I know John Lucas talked about this, but um, using and relying on some C++ code through RCPP uh, allows you to do value of information analysis and other types of analysis that might take a long time to run in Excel. Um, another thing is transparency. So being able to separate out code um, from data and then make all code available publicly, um, especially where, where these decisions are being made uh, publicly, for example, in NICE, um, makes a lot of sense. Um, and then in public health, uh, sort of reach and replication is really important. So being able to create one model, uh, which could then be used in multiple countries, for example, um, has obvious implications, especially where a model from a um, developed country um, may be um, applicable to a, a less developed country, which may not be able to afford um, to, to be paying um, large groups of statisticians and health economists to, to model this kind of things. So you do it in one place and then make it available everywhere. Um, and the last thing is, is stakeholder engagement. So I think Shiny helps a lot with this. Um, but there are limitations of, of moving this way. So the biggest one is the learning curve. Um, trying to convince um, people who have been working in Excel and are maybe 50 years old, 55 years old, that they need to spend a year kind of gradually learning R ah, um, is quite difficult. And there's a lot of pushback when I talk to uh, people working in, in the industry. Um, there's also the issue of 
our models being seen as, as quite black box and hard to review, which I don't disagree with, I always, which I disagree with, but um, that's a, a pushback that we get quite a lot. And then there's the issue of, of relying on packages that haven't necessarily been, been verified. And I know there's a big push within the, the HGAR um, community now to be kind of quality uh, testing those packages. And the biggest one until 2016, uh, or more recently, was the lack of an easy to build uh, graphical, graphical user interface. Um, so people who are used to work, working with Excel, pretty much everybody can pick up an Excel sheet and kind of play around with it and see what cells are doing what. And it might be a bit confusing, but most people are familiar with it. If you give somebody a R project with a load of scripts and functions, people get scared pretty quickly. Um, and they find it harder to, to kind of play around with and understand what's going on. Um, so Shiny is a, a huge kind of tool to kind of increase the reach of the use of R in, in HTA and, and health economics more widely. Um, so in order to try and help with this, uh, myself and a, a colleague, uh, Paul Schneider, who I do a lot of this type of work with, um, wrote a... Um, an article published uh, peer reviewed in Welcome Open Research um, that basically steps the user through a very simple, or the reader through a very simple um, teaching health economic model uh, called the Six Sigma model. Um, and it describes the process um, necessary to wrap that model up into a single function and put it into Shiny in a very, very simple example that allows the users then to change some of those model assumptions and rerun the model uh, remotely. Um, so I'll very briefly kind of step through the logic of that. Um, and I know many of you have been more familiar with uh, uh, Shiny than myself. So, um, and yeah, so I don't want to go into too much detail on that, but I guess understanding the, the process of wrapping up the entire economic model into a single function um, is, is the core thing here. So you might have some inputs which are derived from statistical analysis. Um, so, for example, fitting a survival curve or hazard rates, costs, that, that kind of thing. And those inputs are fed into an economic model, which is a single function in R. And then they're then output as a series of costs and qualities and then graphically displayed to, to the user. Um, and so if we think of um, the economic model as just one function, we can then use Shiny to input or allow users to change the value of a series of inputs to that function. Um, so at its simplest, um, all, we're, all we're doing in, in this, this paper is describing a process of allowing um, Shiny to change some inputs to, a, to one function. Um, so if I just you know, go very briefly to the GitHub repo. So all of the code and um, material for this uh, paper are available on GitHub, and there's a link in the, the PDF of the slides. Um, but just briefly, um, here's a kind of picture of the model. So individuals start off healthy, and then in discrete time intervals, they can transition to being sick, sicker, or dead, and they can transition back from being sick to being healthy, um, or from being sick to dead. Um, and in order to incorporate uncertainty, um, we create a function which um, basically runs or creates lots of different values from a distribution. And I won't go into too much detail on that. Um, and then these are input into a single health economic model. Um, in this case, the, a Markov model um, called Six Sigma. Um, and this Markov model um, basically performs a series of matrix multiplications to work out the total costs and total qualities of two different interventions in this case, no treatment or a treatment. Um, we then wrap up that entire um, model into a single function, which in this case we, we call wrapper. Um, and then we, within Shiny, um, put a series of inputs to that wrapper. Um, and so we, we call those here just for, for teaching purposes, um, Shiny inputs. And then we have a single click button uh, which allows the users to, to run or update the model. So this is kind of, in our estimation, the simplest possible reproducible example we could create. Um, and we discuss kind of further additional functionality that, that's useful from that. Um, 
So yeah, a link to that paper is available uh, in the slides. Um, but I just want to briefly discuss before we stop two examples. So we've previously created models for the or shiny apps from our models for the WHO on female gender mutilation, which allowed um, users from different countries to enter their country. <coughs> it would then update all of the parameter inputs um, to be um, relevant for that country. If they felt that they disagreed with some of those parameter inputs, they could change them manually and then rerun the model from a remote server and have all of their <coughs> graphs and tables update. Uh, we also did a project with Parkrun um, doing some geospatial analysis, and we showed them the results from a number of different statistical models, um, which were trying to maximize different things based on different value judgments. And we used Shiny to show them, um, uh, allow them to toggle between the, the results from different models using different value judgments, and then display that graphically um, or display that um, on a map. Um, and there's, there's several publications there um, about, about that process. Um, and then just finally, we have um, a HDA um, tool, which allows users to copy and paste in um, costs and qualities from an Excel model, um, and then get our quality plots uh, in ggplot and plotly um, pop out of, of that. Um, and this is, this is a strategy to try and kind of incorporate R into different stages of that process until eventually the whole process is done in R, and then the whole process can be just be done in one um, kind of project. Um, so it's kind of gradually winning over each stage of the process. So I'll stop sharing there um, and take any questions. OK, thank you. There, there are no questions at the moment coming up. Um, I just wanted to pick up, I'll ask a question. Uh, you were saying about people being very reluctant and resistant to using R and Shine or relying upon it. What are your strategy or how do you convince people? Is it a very slow process? Is it like a, wow, look at that Shiny, we trust that instantly. What are your tips? Um, so the Shiny, the Shiny apps are huge um, because it gives, it gives the decision maker and the stakeholder um, the ability to play around with uh, with the model themselves. And so what was kind of perceived as being a black box, a load of code that they didn't understand what to do with, suddenly becomes something that they are in control of. Um, so that has a huge impact. Um, the other thing is just the power of how quick it is to wrap up the entire model into a function and then do just um, treat that as a series of inputs and outputs and do statistical analysis to understand the effects of different inputs on different outputs incredibly quickly compared to trying to do that in Excel. Um, and that allows stakeholders, especially from pharmaceutical companies, to kind of understand what inputs they need to focus on when trying to make their business case um, to NICE. Um, so yeah, so I guess there's, there's two things. There's, there's the ease of use and then there's also the where is the incentive for them? Um, and if there's a business case for it, then it's it's really obvious. We've had a question that's kind of related to that, I think. The shiny process to get the output into Office documents looks complicated to the non-skilled. This is a big question. Is it? So to get, <laughs> so to get an output from shiny, you mean into Word? Uh, yeah, into the Office documents, yes. I think it's the having it in the shiny and getting it out. It yeah, might be the entire process, actually, to be fair. So there's a presentation yesterday, was it, on the use of, um, or I think it's NHS Scotland. But yeah, you can use the officer package um, within Shiny. So within the Shiny server, you can be creating a document and then exporting it. So we have an example on our on the Hervis, Hervis package and app, which allows you to download a, a markdown document or a Word document um, with all of your results i'd just like to talk chip in there as well and another because i've been doing this all morning promoting our slack group which you're very welcome to come to but also if anybody has any problems with specific things like that uh however technical you are you're very welcome to pitch your questions there and i'm sure somebody will come in and help you because we've all been there and tried stuff and and still learning so i'm going to have to call it a little bit quick on the time others oh, if there are any more questions that was the only one in there there was a question from jen lucas um presentation which you may be able to answer because you kind of crossed over 
There was a question about models working with small data sets, um, such as a few hundred values. Actually, that's quite a lot for some of the small data sets we have. Some of them are just tens. So do these models also work there or do you have warnings? I mean, particularly for Shiny, do people get the warning? This is actually very small. So. Uh, so if you're if you were trying to incorporate um, uncertainty, you, you typically wouldn't have a really small data set because your your range of uncertainty your range of uncertainty would be too small and you wouldn't be able to kind of draw a distribution from that. So ten we tend to run these models thousands of times, um, if not tens of thousands of times, um, just to make sure that our mean value is kind of reliable. Um, otherwise. One in, if you only have say ten values, one in ten could be some massive spurious result, and then yeah. that's going to massively influence your mean. So, okay, well, thank you very much. So we are sort of feeling a bit rushed because we're going to go into the um, eleven o'clock now. Two minutes silence. You'll be delayed going into the next one by two minutes. See you soon.